How is everybody? Good, 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 good. Um, I would like to inform you, um, I, I don't know if it was in the bulletin, uh, that uh, Pastor Vili it will be leaving us. Uh, the South England Conference have voted uh, to assign him to be the senior pastor of Hampstead Church. And he's going to be starting on the 1st of February. Um, he's been with us for several, well, been with you for seven and a half years. Um, so I'm sure he's going to be missed. But on the 1st of February, he'll be leaving New Bold uh, to take up a new assignment. He'll still be 50% uh, as the media director of the South England Conference, uh, but he will no longer be a pastor at New Bold. Um, so we just want to wish him all the best. Uh, but he'll be around for many weeks to come still. Today, um, we start a new series. Uh, this series is called Journeying with Jesus. Over the next few months, we're going to be going through the entire book of Luke. The pastoral team have decided to choose the book of Luke to go through chapter by chapter. And we'll be preaching uh, to you each week out of the book of Luke. Uh, and so this starts our Journeying with Jesus series. Uh, we hope to take you on a journey with Jesus as we uh, navigate the pages of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, today I start that series uh, with Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and the, the title of my sermon is When Hope Fades. When Hope Fades. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven. It's your time now. Speak through me, Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When hope fades. What is hope? I, 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 I had to look up what hope was. and I, I found this definition and it says this. Hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. Hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. Or some could say an optimistic attitude of mind that is based on an expectation of positive outcomes. Hope. This week I was at the graveside of a mother who had lost her son. And this is always a tragic time when, uh, as a minister, I have to deal with bereavement. But uh, none so more than when you're having to deal with bereavement of a parent who has lost a child. You see, uh, no parent should ever have to bury their child. And so there is this great sadness in the air. But there is something that gives me a, 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 the courage and confidence to, to say the right words, and that is hope. Paul tells us when he's uh, writing his book to the, uh, in, in Thessalonians uh, that uh, we don't grieve as others that have no hope. Uh, I'm still able to give that family hope that uh, even though your son has passed away, this is not the end. The, the book is not finished. The story is not over. There is still a hope that you will see your son again. This is not the end. Hope does so much for our lives. There are so many times in our lives that we rely on hope to get us through. I, 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 when I, I moved to, to, to Newbold, I, I had to buy a property and uh, I, I remember going to the bank and you, you get the mortgage in principle. Now the mortgage in principle just says, listen, uh, in principle I'm going to give you this amount of money and so on that basis you can go and look for a house and a home uh, uh, based on the amount that they're willing to give you. 
So I started looking, I found a nice home, I made an offer, but now uh, the principle needs to be turned into reality. And so they start to do all the checks, and this normally takes a period of time, and that period of time had elapsed. Uh, and so now I'm, I'm getting a little bit nervous and I, I'm wondering what's going to happen. Are they going to make this principle a reality? And all I have to rely on is hope. Jesus, you've got to come through for me. Jesus, you're going to do this for me. Because that's how we live. We survive. We, we, we cling on to hope. Luke begins the entire book with no hope. Luke, uh, uh, this historian, he's writing to his, uh, well we don't know if it's a friend, but Theolophysus, uh, he, he's writing to him uh, and, and Luke says this, he says, listen, uh, there have been many accounts of people that have journeyed with Jesus. Uh, but I need to give you this account to give you a, a more accurate account. Uh, Luke really wants to give us this historical document. He, he tells us specific times. He, he does that by uh, telling us who, which monarch is reigning at the time. And, and, and Luke really wants to give us a chronological order of events. But you need to understand the context in which Luke is writing. Israel was once a powerful, prestigious, proud people. Uh, they uh, used to be a superpower, constantly remembering the times when David sat on the throne, when Solomon sat on the throne, and they were this great nation that did wonderful things. But now, they are a persecuted people. They live in an environment where they have to pay taxes to tax collectors on behalf of procurators who have been empowered by the Herods and, and these Herods are mere puppets for Rome. Rome has been oppressing Israel for a long time now. For over a thousand years the Israelites have been waiting for a saviour. But don't you know that uh, the more you wait, the longer uh, you start to lose hope? For over a thousand years, over uh, 25 generations, uh, uh, grandfathers have died, fathers have died, and they're still waiting for a saviour. Waiting really starts to diminish hope. Christmas is one of my favorite seasons. And even more so now that I have children. Uh, my children uh, just love Christmas. And I remember last year, we got a Christmas tree in our house and we put it up. And uh, we put it up probably about mid-December and the kids went crazy. They just love the Christmas tree because there's presents underneath it. And they're just running around all the time because they love Christmas. At the end of last year, I said to my wife, I'm not going to wait until the middle of December. We're going to, as soon as December 1 comes, I'm, I'm going to put the tree up. Now, the kids have been waiting for Christmas since last Christmas. As soon as Christmas is over, it, is it Christmas yet? Is it Christmas yet? Now, anybody that has kids know that kids have no concept of time whatsoever. Uh, you can say to them, oh, listen, uh, this is going to happen tomorrow. Five minutes later, is it going to happen yet? They have no concept of time. And, and so this year came around and December 1 came and I thought, okay, let me go and get this tree. I wasn't able to get it on December 1. About December 3, I went and I got the tree and I brought it home and it was all wrapped up. And it was there and the kids saw it and they were excited. The problem was is that I had lost the Christmas decoration because we had just moved, they were in boxes, and so I had to put the tree, I had to hide the tree until I could find the Christmas decorations. It took me a few days, couldn't find them, 
concluded that I needed to go and buy some more Christmas decorations. So I went to the shop and I bought the Christmas decorations and me and my wife waited until the kids were in bed and we decorated the tree and all this sort of stuff and this wonderful, nice tree. Went to bed. Excited that in the morning the kids would see the tree. Woke up in the morning, my wife is exhausted. I'm saying, well, what happened? She said, I've been up all night. See, when I go to sleep, I'm out. Nothing can wake me up. So my wife had been up all night. I said, what happened? She said, the kids were up from 3 o'clock in the morning. I said, why would I have been 3 o'clock in the morning? It turns out that somehow my daughter had realized she had gone downstairs for something and she had seen the tree. She had run upstairs and woke up her brother saying, it's Christmas. It's Christmas. And, and, and so now they're just excited. They're running around the house and they won't go back to sleep because they think that it's Christmas. Now I have to try and explain to them, guys, Christmas is not for a good three weeks. Next night, they don't sleep. It's Christmas. It's Christmas. And they're just eagerly anticipating waiting for these presents that are going to be underneath the tree because they have no concept of time. And so every night they're, they're, they're passionately waiting for these presents until after a week uh, the passion starts to fade. The hope starts to fade because maybe Christmas is not coming when we thought it was coming. Now they're sleeping through the night and we're not having that issue, but I'm sure on Christmas Eve, when we say Christmas is tomorrow, the same issue is going to happen. I feel this is where Israel were. Israel passionately waited for, for Christ, but now hope has started to fade. Is he really uh, going to come? And uh, Listen to what Ella White says. She says this. She says, the Jews in a great degree lost sight of the teaching of the ritual service. That, that service had been instituted by Christ himself. In every part it was a symbol of him. And it had been full of vitality and spirit. But the, two, but the Jews lost the spiritual life from the ceremonies. Instead of resting upon... Uh, sorry, they lost the spiritual life of the ceremonies and clung to the dead forms. They trusted to the sacrifices and ordinances themselves instead of resting upon him to whom they pointed. When I read that, I, I, I'm thinking to myself, are we at that same place? For over 2,000 years, we've heard the statement, Christ is coming soon. We all, well, for those of us that grew up in the church, we've heard Christ is coming soon. But has our hope started to fade? Has the, the beauty of worship and the passion that we may have once had when we got baptized started to fade? And it's so interesting because when I look at the early Christians who thought the imminent return of Christ was soon, the passion that they had and how they sold everything that they had and, and eagerly evangelized Christ. But then, maybe Christ is not coming as soon as we thought and hope starts to fade. But then I see it re revigored and revitalized in 1844. Uh, when our founding fathers believed that Christ was coming soon, hope then uh, uh, revitalized them, and, and they're passionate again, and, and there is this, this sense of urgency in the things that we do. And then we find ourselves here again. Has hope faded? Do we find ourselves like Israel? who are literally uh, just doing these dead forms of rituals. The scholar said how uh, Rome would choose the high priest, and uh, this role was, was, was just masked in, in so much politics and, and crime. Do we have this stuff in our church? Have 
we lost hope? Has hope faded? And it's within this context, a context where Israel uh, seems to have lost hope, they're uh, waiting for this Messiah that said that he's going to come, but hasn't come yet, and uh, all of this, that Luke then interjects two stories with no hope. Elizabeth. The text says how she was a righteous woman, a good, upstanding woman. The problem is, is that she's barren. She's been trying for years to have a child. Uh, but now age has taken over and uh, she's now in a situation where physically and scientifically she is not able to have a child. Even though she's been trying for years. It's impossible now. And when we hear words like impossible, uh, hope fades even more. Uh, 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 my, my time has passed. If, if, if only I would able, able to conceive when I was a, a few years younger. But, but the Bible also tells us about Zechariah. Her husband, he's also a righteous man, he's a priest. And uh, the story continues and, and, and says how uh, Zechariah was chosen to go and uh, burn incense in the temple. Now this was a once in a lifetime opportunity because there were so many priests that uh, they would choose who would go into the temple by casting lots. And so uh, Zechariah has this opportunity to go into the temple. His wife is barren. Now let me say this, that Zechariah has been praying for a child. He's been praying for a son. But I want to say this to you. He had lost hope in his prayers. He didn't actually believe that they were going to come true. How, are, are we praying prayers in vain? Are we praying prayers out of uh, routine and monotonousness? Are we just doing something because this is what we've always done but not actually believing that there is power in prayer? How do we know this? Because when the angel comes to Zechariah when he is burning incense in the temple, the first thing the angel says to, 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 to Zechariah is this. It says, it, he says, um, Verse 13, it says, Zechariah, your prayers has been heard. Zechariah, the prayers that you've been praying, the Lord has heard them. But Zechariah's lost hope. Zechariah <laughs> doesn't believe that it's, it's possible. And so Zechariah says, well, uh, uh, in, in verse 18, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. Even though I've been praying for this one thing, I didn't actually think that it was going to happen anymore because it's impossible. Scientifically, this is, this is out of the norm. A hopeless situation. Jesus. He will be a great 
and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. In the midst of all of this hopelessness interjects Jesus. And, and Jesus is the turning point for the entire chapter because this chapter that started out with uh, so much hopelessness, so much uh, uh, lack of enthusiasm, now changes momentum and turns into a musical. Everybody starts singing. Mary starts singing. Zachariah starts singing. Because when Jesus combines with your hopelessness, there is joy. This is why the Bible says, joy to the world. The king has come. When Jesus comes into your situation, there is joy. Now let me say this to you, that when God blesses you, the world might not always see the same blessings that you see. When God does something for you and you're rejoicing about it, other people may not rejoice with you. One of the interesting things that I found about this, this passage was uh, the, the stark contrast in the results that happened. You see, Elizabeth was barren and so kind of looked down upon in society, not favoured as much. Uh, Mary was a virgin and she was engaged to be married and so she would had a, quite a good standing uh, in society. But when this great news happened, Elizabeth, who kind of people weren't so happy with, now she's pregnant, society would have looked on her with, oh wow, God has blessed you. Whereas Mary, on the other hand, when she got pregnant, society looked down on her because they see, saw it as her getting pregnant outside of wedlock. Both were blessed. But society may have deemed it different in both situations. It's like the reverse happened to both of them. When God blesses you, doesn't matter what other people say, what other people see, enjoy the blessings. Now let's celebrate. Because for me, and this was our scripture text that I didn't read, Luke 1, verse 37, says this. Because when the angel has a conversation with Mary and tells her about Elizabeth, Mary says, how can this be? How is this possible? Uh, this situation was hopeless. There was no hope in this situation. Uh, this was scientifically impossible. And... The angel says this, verse 37, for nothing is impossible with God. The word of encouragement for today is, no matter what you're going through, no matter what is happening in your life, no matter what situation you're in, nothing is impossible for God. And because nothing is impossible for God, whatever scenario, whatever situation you're in, there is hope. Sometimes we look within the sphere of mankind, we look at what we're able to do within our own power, within our own might. And, and when we've exhausted all possibilities, when we've exhausted all other avenues, then oh, there's no hope. But there's always hope with Jesus. Because... Nothing is impossible for God. Have hope. Have hope. We've been waiting for 2,000 years, but let me give you some good news. If Jesus came once, he's coming again. There's no point in coming to save us, if you're, uh, save us from sin if you're not going to come and eradicate sin. Jesus is coming again. And he's coming soon. This is the, the beauty of the Christmas season. It reminds us that this Jesus who said he was going to come came. 
And because he said that he was going to do something, he will fulfill it. And he will come again. We need to find hope in this. Let's not be like this and, and worship in vain and, and go through mundane rituals just because this is our habit. Let us put some life in our worship. Let us believe that Jesus is coming again. Let's go spread the word to everybody that is out there, especially in this Christmas season. Because Jesus is coming again. I want to close with this story. I know none of you will go to the the race dogs or the horse racing. But greyhound racing is a popular betting sport. Watching beautiful dogs run around a track. It's different to horse racing where you have a jockey. Uh, these dogs uh, will run after a mechanical rabbit. And the dogs are trained to run after this rabbit and so uh, when the, the buzzer goes, the rabbit shoots off and uh, they run round after this rabbit. Some years ago in a Florida track the dogs were poised, ready to shoot off. The starter pressed the buttons, the gate opened and the rabbit flew down the track. The dogs were running after the rabbit. But as the rabbit turned the corner, there was an electronic fail and the rabbit stopped and exploded. Half of the dogs stopped, sat down on the track. Two of them ran into the side of the barriers, breaking some bones. <coughs> My point is this, like greyhounds, are we chasing and pursuing our chosen habits? We need a reason for living, for running the race. What is your goal, your purpose in life? Where lies your hope? Sadly, many of us choose a chase an illusion of a mechanical rabbit of sorts that ultimately offers no hope at all. We chase after material things that if we actually get, serve no purpose in scratching the itch that we actually have in our life. Are we chasing this mechanical rabbit in our life? <coughs> Let this Christmas represent a change that we start to place all our hopes on Jesus and chase after him because nothing is impossible with him. This Christmas, let there be a change. Let us start find a, a new vigor because we have found hope in a hopeless situation because we know that Jesus came once so he's going to come again. Nothing is impossible with Christ. Amen. I'd like to that each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of, other, of others. What's interesting about this verse is that it contains one Greek word, uh, skopos, which means not only look for the needs of others, but study, intentionally study. Like, you know, skopos is in, in the root of the word of microscope and telescope, you know, intentional focused looking. Something which requires effort, which requires time, which requires selfless outlook. And this is how the Bible wants us to look for the needs of others, to study the, need, the happiness of others and uh, do our best to really serve those needs. And as, a, as an example of this kind of service, we have the text that is describing what Jesus actually did, who was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
but emptied himself by taking the form of servant, being born in the likeness of man and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even that of the cross. So he gave us an example what it means to really put the interests of others before our own and how far he is willing to go to do that. When we give, it hurts. It's a sacrifice. We are emptying ourselves. We are giving what we have to, uh, for the benefit of others. So this is the mindset I would like us to have when we give our tithes and offerings. That we really scope us, study intentionally the needs of others and invest ourselves to the point of actually feeling uh, uncomfortable and feeling that we are actually sacrificing. Now, I will ask our ushers to come and pick up the offering. <coughs> Thank you.
that passeth all understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>